Welcome everyone. Sorry if you hear some dogs barking on my background. Um, yeah, we are going to start our first time uh, student research presentations. We have two student presenters uh, who are really excited to share with you uh, their research. So make sure um, I encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat so we know who we have present. Tell us uh, what college you're attending, where you are uh, right now. Um, and so our first student presenter is Kosivi Mawo. He's from CUNY, Borough of Manhattan Community College, and he will be presenting in mathematics discipline. So, Kasivi, I give the floor to you. I will stop sharing my screen and you're free to share yours. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I thank you for the organizer for this um, platform. Uh, I wasn't really sure that if how should, how should I start because uh, <laughs> My main focus, of course, is STEM, but um, my main major was so, supposedly to be uh, civil engineering. But uh, during the beginning of um, this research, I was taking like uh, linear algebra and then my professor proposed me to do this research, which is really related to a Queen research program because I live in New York, in Queens, in so that's basically city uh, CUNY's program. So then uh, that's my first time attending this, also this uh, platform. I wasn't expecting also to present uh, this program, but anyways, long story short, I'm here. And thank you for having me. <laughs> and then I will start sharing. I'm doing a presentation on the fractal dimension and uh, I'm not a mathematician and uh, again, I wasn't expecting to really do this research, but my professor proposed me and then I was selected. And I'm do I will doing this presentation also during summer as well. And uh, the title of this project is a fractal dimension. And uh, most of my friends in class, when we talk about fractal dimension, say, what is fractal dimension? <laughs> and then most of the question is like, Oh, simple way to explain fractal dimension is like, we know how to calculate like area of a square, right? But how do we calculate a, a, an area of a cloud or something like have irregular shape? So then we need to break them down small pieces. So, and then that's basically what that means fractal dimension. And uh, the focus of um, uh, this fractal dimension we focus on is a butterfly wings. And the butterfly, why do we choose butterfly? Because butterfly, especially the monarch butterfly, is kind of a rare species right now from some friend who's studying environment. I think they know more about that. I'm, again, I'm not like kind of quote unquote an expert in environment and all those stuff, but it's kind of a great uh, project. And uh, yeah, so the, in, in the introduction, we would like to investigate the butterfly wings pattern and uh, we took a ruler and then we can really measure, but we need to break down small pieces to really identify the area of each area of the butterfly wings. And uh, the, my mentor is um, a Dr. Farmington. He's in the mathematics area in Queensboro, Queens, Manhattan, Queensboro uh, in Manhattan Community College. He is the one together we are working on the project. And uh, his focus on uh, this French mathematician is called Mandebo, right, in 1977, was able to came with the word fractal dimension. Long story short, eh, we will go to what's the purpose of this, right? We would like to collect. We did, he did the multiple uh, experiment on this butterfly, like swallow tail, all those stuff, the variant of butterfly. But him and I was focusing on butterfly monarch butterfly that he raised himself. He collected the eggs near our campus, like our school area, and then he raised them 
And during COVID, that was his time to really expand on that. So we able to analyze and we use um, the original picture that he took that you can say that those are the original butterfly. And then we took it, we put it on the stencil maker. And with stencil maker, we was able to clean it out and we put it on Photoshop to have this. And we put on the MATLAB. And the MATLAB, that's what I was using. Uh, and to really update, to pull up the average, like to pull up the, the fractal dimension number that we have for the male, as you can see on that area. And then on the female that you can see on that area. And when we put everything on Excel, we cut the average is a one point five. We know for sure that there is not gonna be a significant difference between the male and female. But uh, the, although if we collect like a million, like 10,000 or whatever of, uh, a butterfly male and wings, we see that there is no a big difference among those uh, butterfly, right? Like the male and female. But the, it's interesting to know that among those butterfly wings, there is a something that there is a based on MATLAB, we can really able to identify how to calculate the area. I think that's what's was basically amazing stuff that we was able to pull out from that. And uh, don't want to take too much of the time. I will really stop there. And then if you have any question, maybe we discuss after my, uh, after Jackie passed away. So then I think Jackie has more to share than I have. So <laughs> I don't want to take too much of the time. And uh, my stuff is kind of short again. And then thank you so much for this opportunity. So Jackie, you can take it away. If you have any question, maybe I will take it later on. Maybe. Right, thank you. All right, Jackie, you can take it away. Yes, I'm just pulling. Thank you. Thank you, Kasui. And I just wanted to let our audience know that um, Jackie is attending Los Medanos College in Northern California, and her discipline is chemistry. Can everyone see my slides? Is that good? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to minimize this and then get started. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, uh, whatever time zone you're living in. Um, my name is Jacqueline Villalobos from Los Medanos College. And today, I'll be going along this journey with you all about learning about my research project and addressing a big question. Can grape stems be used to treat contaminated water? In the next 10 minutes, we'll determine if grape stems, also known as grape pinnacles, are a low cost and friendly bio, eco friendly bioabsorbent for water treatment. So let's dive right into it uh, by first sharing that neighborhoods and cities everywhere in the US are facing a high risk of heavy metal contamination. And this pollution is existing all across America. This heat map seen before you was published by the Washington State Department of Health, which you can see different reporting state by state of heavy metal poisoning, one being less at risk and 10 being in danger. Knowing that 10 billion people uh, all over the world lack in access to clean and safe drinking water, um, one major contributor is nickel contamination, which is a big problem in the United States. It's an ongoing problem that can be traced back to pipings, fittings, batteries, household appliances. And if we consume this nickel, um, we could result into major health complications, not only impacting you and me, but our loved ones. You know, this type of heavy metal contamination requires appropriate treatment to remove the pollutants. But unfortunately, the costs are very high, ranging from anywhere as 45,000 to 50 million per water treatment. An example of this treatment could be ion exchange resin, and um, which is expensive. Uh, and we know that water is essential. Water is one of the most important substances on earth. All plants, animals, human beings, we need water to survive. So there has to be a safer, low cost, eco-friendly way to remove such pollutants in our water. And fortunately, there's some hope. Several studies have suggested that bioabsorbents such as dates, 
orange peels, avocado skins are an effective bioabsorbance for heavy metals, which is exciting. And knowing that our, given our California's major wine industry, um, we produce a modest amount of grape waste. And we wanted to use these grape waste for a good use. So I, use, I, I investigated whether these grape pentacles or stems is, an effective, uh, is effective in removing nickel ions in water. So that is something we're gonna dive into today, talking about um, our bio waste. So I hypothesized that our grape stems are an effective bioabsorbent because other agricultural bioabsorbents have shown the removal of other heavy metals like lead by 95%. Therefore, I hypothesize that the functional groups detected in IRR will be changed after the nickel treatment. So how did I approach the experiment? Sounds like a, lot, a, a bunch of fancy jargon, but today I'm gonna go step-by-step step on how I did this. Um, by first, I purchased a pound of grapes at my local grocery store. I washed, dried them, and cut them into stems um, by half an inch pieces. While this was going on, I placed DI water and nickel nitrate in a flask to create a 0 0.02 concentration of nickel nitrate. The reason for this specific concentration of nickel um, was used because this concentration is enough to visualize our endpoint in our titration, which I'll go more in detail further. Um, and the reason why we left uh, our grape stems in our concentrated water uh, for one hour was because other studies suggested that one to four hours is an effective time, for, time point for our absorbance. So once we have that going on, step two was diving into our titration. The reason why we had a titration performed uh, was because the purpose of a titration in this experiment was to find the unknown concentration of our nickel pre and post treatment. So let me dive into that. So first we use an indicator called murexide that was placed after our treatment. Uh, the purpose of murexide was to find, um, to allow us to visualize the endpoint. Um, EDTA is a chelating agent uh, used to help determine the concentration of heavy metals. So in figure A, we have our indicator, drops of our indicator um, was put into our, our contaminated solution. Then um, figure B, we had EDTA and nickel, um, and the nickel and the EDTA will bind together um, and the, nickel, uh, the indicator will let us know when the endpoint has occurred, um, giving us a change of color, um, which is important when we wanted to analyze our results. Uh, the next step, step number three, uh, which was my favorite part, uh, we dried our grape stems pre and post treatment. Um, we have the solid grape stems and the funnest part was 50 hours of work was to grind that solid into a transparent substance. And the reason why we took a lot of hours to grind up the, the grape stems was because we wanted to create an IR disc, which is a disc shown right here. That was the disc. The purpose of the disc in creating that was because we needed that disc in order to put it in our IR machine. Um, the IR machine creates a spectrum for both our pre and post uh, grape peels, uh, grape stem uh, treatment to see and show our functional groups. And so with that being said, I want to then introduce to my results. So what happened to our titration? And that's the first thing I want to cover. So uh, these are results and I want to dive in and kind of explain what happened. So the orange slope indicates our untreated stems and our blue slope uh, indicates our treated stems. The point of the photometric titration was to first visualize our endpoint, um, which we could see here. Um, the endpoint is indicated by the change in slope. As you can see, um, we have indicator endpoint. Uh, once we have indicator endpoint, we'll use our endpoint to calculate our concentration. And we did that for both our untreated and treated stems. And it turns out that both of our treated and untreated stems had the same concentration, which meant one thing. The grape stems um, suggested that it didn't absorb any of the nickel, which is important and unfortunate, but it's okay. Um, then we dive into step number four of our results. Um, before I dive into step four of my results, I wanna first mention 
um, a little bit about the most common macromolecules in uh, most stems, plant stems. Um, so the chemical composition of most common macromolecules found in our surface of plant stem are cellulose and hemicellulose. Those are two common macromolecules. And what we wanted to do is look even further um, and look at their functional groups. And so these are the two functional groups we're looking at and want to look at at IRR, which is an OH hydroxyl group and a carbonyl group. And that's something we wanted to analyze if it was present in our, our, our results. Um, so these are my IR results. Um, for those who don't know what an IR um, is, or it's a meter that um, induces radiation and excites the molecules. So it gets the, the molecules really excited um, and it generates a spectrum of energy absorbed by the molecule and allows a wavelength of light to hit and which will help us determine the functional groups. And so the blue graph here um, is the, the results for the IR for the pre-nickel treatment. And the, um, the green is the post-nickel treatment. And so uh, with that being said, we found both of our functional groups. We found the hydroxyl group and the carbonyl group. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that both of the same common uh, functional groups were found pre and post treatments, meaning the composition of of bondage is the same. So nothing really changed um, in the anatomical level. So results, Jackie has spoken for the past 10 minutes. So what happened? Uh, well, research suggested, our results suggested that great pentacles or stems are not a reliable bioabsorbent to remove nickel ions. That is unfortunate, um, but we have established a good analytical assay of nickel, um, which we wanna use in future research. Although grape stems were not effective in removing nickel, we will also want to dive in into the future and looking at whether grape stems are effective in removing different dyes. That's another approach we would like to investigate. Another one would be using pistachio shells to see if uh, a pistachio shell treatment will, um, is effective in removing nickel ions. And this research is exciting because this will help us find eco-friendly, low-cost treatments for water purification. Like I mentioned before, the United States is facing a, a huge crisis of, of contaminated water from Oakland to everywhere. Um, this is an ongoing problem and we want to find eco-friendly ways to combat this problem. With that being said, I would like to acknowledge some very important people who helped me along this research. Uh, first, most importantly, Dr. Melinda Capes, who is currently in this room. Uh, I'd like to thank her for allowing me to um, be mentored by her and for her unwavering support day in and day out, those late nights and those fun Saturday mornings. Paul West for allowing me to have the lab space. Dr. Nicole Traeger for um, her support the LMC College Foundation for funding my research and um, everyone today for just listening to uh, my research, which uh, took a long time, but thank you so much. Um, and I'll have time for some questions if there's any. Thank you, Jackie and Priscilla so much for presenting. We do have one question, uh, it's to, for Jackie. What made you pick grapes for your research? That's a great question. Uh, the reason why we picked grapes is because California is known for the great wine industry. So there's grapes everywhere for wine. So we wanted to use this bio waste for good. And so that is the reason why we chose grape stems. Could both of you um, mention uh, to our attendees, how did you get in the research? As we know, not many uh, students are participating in the research at the community college level. So we would like to hear your journey, your experience. <laughs> All right, yeah, so uh, I was originally looking for research myself, but uh, I wasn't really sure like what kind of research you do. And then, then uh, when my math professor, especially when I was doing linear algebra and we was using MATLAB, 
And my professor was telling me, oh, I will recommend you to a project, a research project that maybe you might like or might like, don't like, but why not you try, you know? So I just jump in without hesitating. I say, okay, let me try. So that's where I, again, I'm not really expecting to do butterfly, but I'm doing butterfly just with the sense of trying to figure out what that means to do a research and then to just start from somewhere. I think that's my small history regarding research. But anyway, I was looking for research along the line and this came out, I just jump in. Thank you. Inge Kassiri, Jackie, could you share your experience? So I've always been interested in research and wanted to find a way to kind of tap into my curiosity. I know attending a community college, there's a lack of funding. I'm fortunate that uh, Dr. Capes, who's in the room, uh, shout out to her, <laughs> and uh, the college, uh, Los McDonald's College, they had um, were able to fund some research projects. And so um, I was able to just kind of talk to my mentor and show uh, interest in what I wanted to do and have that experience. So I think all it took was speaking out and showing interest and um, having people advocate for you in order for you to have the space and the resources to um, do your research. So I highly encourage everyone who's interested in uh, tapping into a question to, to pursue that um, and to not be discouraged if um, funding is, is a lack of uh, a resource. Thank you so much, Jackie, for sharing. We have one more presentation uh, for today. Uh, so we have one student, Savannah Rindal. She's joining us from Texas. She's currently attending uh, South Plains College and she studies biology sciences. Uh, Savannah, you can go, uh, you can turn on your video and if you like, you can share your screen. Hello. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Yes. All right, like she mentioned, my name is Savannah Randall and oh, what's going on? How do I make this thing at the top go away, the bar? You can click on slide show and then um, start from the beginning. Play from start. Right, so my presentation is over do wing morphometrics and pigmentation vary with geographic isolation and examination of canyon ruby spots in the southwestern US. So my introduction is body size and coloration are signals used by males to attract mates and ward off rivals. Since these traits are under sexual selection, they may differ with geographic isolation. However, they have not been tested, which means Can you give me one second, please? I don't know why it's going forward.
do you need any assistance sharing your slides? Um, so this, I made I made it with my mentor, and it has narrations on it, but it's um, it's skipping. So I'm trying to read it, and it's playing, but it shouldn't be doing that because I rehearsed it, and it wasn't doing that, and I don't know why it's doing it. Do you want just to talk about your research without sharing your screen? Um, I can do that. That would be great. I think I fixed it. I'm sorry about that. Um, the reason why this uh, research is so important is because Kenyan ruby spots are aquatic organisms and with the climate changing, we're looking at sexual selection rather than um, just other selections. Uh, in this figure one, these Kenyan ruby spots at the bottom left are the males as seen by their big vibrant red spots on their wings and then the female have orange on their wings. Wing size, red spot size, and spot chromaticity, hue, and saturation is the main focus of the research uh, for the males to see if they do truly use their spots for sexual selection. We compared these traits across sky islands, and our objective was to determine whether there were differences that reflected population isolation. In our predictions, we expect that traits under survival selection, like the wing size and shape, do not differ across sites. And we expect that the traits under sexual selection, like wing spot and color, to differ across sites. I made this topographic map of all the sites that we went to. We went to Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico to collect the Canyon Ruby spots. In the methods, in figure three and four, as you can see, in figure three, we took the forewing and hind wings of both sides, and we looked at them under the microscope to look at the wing chromaticity of the spots. And we used a protocol called TOWD, or Targeted Odonata Wing Dig Digitization, which was a pro project that we were doing with Will Kuhn. And our methods continued. The resulting scans were uploaded to TOWD, which measured wing length, wing spot, spot size, and spot chromaticity. Here you can see on this page that we used an Epson scan in order to scan the wings as closely as possible as we could into the system. If you see this note card right here where it has the information, the information shows where they were found, the day they were found, and they're categorized by a color and a number to keep them in order. In figure six, this is a close-up through that microscope that was mentioned earlier, and it shows the coloration of the hue. One thing I want to mention is that there is still, we are still waiting on the results for the chromaticity and saturation of the wing spot size. The darkness of the wingtip was qualitatively assessed between four people. The sections were extremely light, light, medium, dark, and extremely dark. As you can see in this picture, the wingtip is going to be the very right of the wing where you see that coloration. Other analyses are currently in progress. In this, the methods continued. I color coded the outer length and width to show the apex ratio, the outer length and width, and the inner length and width. And in the widest ratio, this orange and this tip angle shows what was used on the scanner, what we were mainly looking for. 
on this page in the results, this is what is known as a correlation plot. If you see these dark blue dots that go down the middle, this is the set standard for, you could say the area of the four wing to the area of the four wing on both sides. That means that these are directly proportional to each other. And as one gets bigger, the other one gets bigger. So the one is the most direct, directly proportional. The net closer to negative one, it is negatively correlated or it's inversely proportional. And if it's zero or in this white boxes, that means they're uncorrelated. So if the four wing was to get bigger, that doesn't mean that the hind wing will get bigger, which makes them uncorrelated. On this page, I have I did a box plot, box and whiskers. Whenever box plots overlap each other, it means that what we're looking for is so closely related that there's not much result to it. So as we would expected with the wing size and shape that they did not differ across sites since we were looking for sexual selection instead of survival. The boxes are also the 25 to 75 percent where that coloration is, and then the whiskers are the 95 percent, which makes up that portion. The dots are also the outliers, which you can call the anomalies, which are the ones that don't really fit inside the box. On this page, as it was mentioned earlier, when we did the assessment of the wingtip and coconino, which was in Arizona, there was almost no differentiation of the color. They were very, very light. And in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the wingtip was very dark, which was very interesting to see throughout the Sky Islands. In conclusion, as we predicted, measures of wing size and shape did not differ across the sites. We're still waiting on the wing spot chromaticity, like early, I mentioned earlier. The wingtip darkness does appear to differ by site, and it's still a work in progress. Like I mentioned earlier, the Sky Islands were in a wetter and milder climate approximately 15,000 years ago. And the reason it's so important to look at the sexual selection is if the climate does continue to get warm, hotter and drier, the, the aquatic organisms will fail to reproduce, which may make them obsolete. The climate change projections indicate a drier and hotter future for this region, which may further isolate populations of these organisms. Increased climate-driven isolation should generate differences in population over time. Changes seen in canyon ruby spots will be visible signal signals of climate change. And here's my acknowledgments page. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savannah. I have a quick question to you, and I asked your predecessors before. Can you share with us, with the audience, how did you get into the research? So as you could have seen on my acknowledgments page, I am in a program with South Plains College, and I was given the opportunity to work at the College of uh, Texas Tech University. And I am working under a mentor, her name is Dr. McIntyre, and I am just so in love with the program that I was put in. And my research is stemming off, a, I believe he's a graduate student, he's getting his master's with this, and he did the genetic makeup of the Kenyan ruby spots, and I'm doing the phenotypic. So he's doing the genotype and I'm doing the phenotype. And there's actually a lot of differences between the Kenyan ruby spots in their genetics, as well as in their coloration and their spot size and their other characteristics. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. If any attendees have questions, feel free to submit them in the chat to any of our presenters. We are accepting questions now. But, um, if until any question comes up, thank you again, Kasiri, Jackie, Savannah, for presenting this morning. Uh, for all current community college students, if you want to present your research, 
at the national setting, we invite you to submit your abstracts for the SACNAS National Conference, uh, for the SACNAS National Diversity in STEM Conference that is scheduled for this October uh, 28 and 30. If you want to know more information about this opportunity, uh, feel free to email me. And so we also have, uh, um, we will be offering uh, travel scholarships to attend the conference. And so if you're a current community college student, you're all eligible to apply for travel scholarship, for research presentation. And that's something which you heard today, our students presenting. Uh, you can also do at the national uh, SACNAS conference with the audience uh, uh, around 5,000 people. And again, it's a national event, so people come from across the country.